morning. It's a great sense of encouragement for me, and it's uh, always a privilege to worship Yahweh, the self-existing one, together with brothers and sisters who have the same faith and hold the same things as precious in my heart as uh, in their hearts as I do. This morning we're going to talk about uh, church at home question mark or rather we're going to be talking about attendance and attendance has kind of changed if you haven't noticed it's changed uh, especially since we've we have so much virtual access I, I know this changed a lot of ways that people worship nowadays and I well they tell this story about at the end of the time there's a big line to St. Peter's Gate of all the people who are going to heaven. They're all waiting in line and, you know, kind of waiting to get their judgment before they enter in. And most likely, it's mostly good people in there. So they're all lined up, you know, waiting to get examined at the gate. And then all of a sudden, there's a fellow near the back, and he just hears a bunch of cheering and applause and people yelling and, and jubilee, you know, just so happy. And he doesn't know what's going on. He can't really see. It's a really long line. And then so he's just going, what's going on? Does anyone know what's going on? And then a fella comes running back there. He says, hey, wh- why is everyone cheering right like that? And then the guy says, Wednesday nights don't count. <laughs> if that joke offends you, Andrew told me that one. So <laughs> text him after church if you had a problem with it. So as we discuss uh, the idea of attendance this morning, I, I, that's kind of a silly joke, but I want it to impress. What I want you guys to know is I'm not picking on anybody. I don't want anyone to be upset. What I feel I have the command to do as a minister of the word is to just show what God wants for us in our attitudes and our actions. And so this morning, I want to really address the attitudes of why is it that attendance has changed? Why is it that people still haven't come back to church? And what's going on? And so I'd like to look at a few things. But let's start with the basic question. What is the church? And I ask that all the time. But what is the church? Well, First Timothy 3 and verse 15, it says, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Well, what's the household of God? He answers it right here, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So what I want to impress upon you with that is church, as we know, is made up of individuals, such as you and I. And when we are collected and assembled together, please know that that is the household of God. That all of us together make up God's dwelling place. And there needs to be a degree of reverence and a degree of awe and wonder that God would even dwell among people like us. And yet he makes us, the people, his house. In Exodus 25, 8 through 9, you see this is familiar imagery like we look at and like we discussed with the Old Testament. It says, and let them make me a sanctuary, God says to his people, that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. Remember, God had these physical dwelling places, the tabernacle, and later on the temple where he manifested his glory and where he spoke to Moses and where he spoke and forgave the people, right? Remember, that was represented the dwelling place or the house of God. And what's the house of God now? Where do we have that glory? Where do we get that forgiveness? Where do we receive the words of truth? It's in the church when we are assembled together. And church simply means ecclesia, and it means, uh, it comes from ek, meaning out from and to. That means you leave the place you currently are and to another destination. And kalio, meaning to call. And it has to do with a group of people called out from one place and to another. It is an assembly or a congregation. So by definition, what does being in the church require? Assembly. By definition, that's what it means by its very word. In Hebrews 3 and verse 6, we're going to look at Hebrews 3, and it's going to point to an Old Testament story. And there's going to be a common theme that I want us to pick up on, and it gives a very clear image about the attitude of when we come together, or when we worship God as an assembled body. In verse 6 of Hebrews 3, it says, But Christ is faithful over God's house. And what do we know is God's house? It's the church. It's us, you and I, as a son. And we are his house. You see, the text tells us that again. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. So we are his house if what? If we hold fast to our boasting and to our hope. All of us collectively assembled together make up the household of God, 
So look at verse 7 and verse 8. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. So what rebellion is he speaking of? Because as far as I'm aware, there's a lot of rebellions in the Old Testament so with, the, with the Israelites, right? And God, there seem to be a numerous amount of them. Well, let's continue reading. In verse 9, it says, Where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray where? In their hearts. This is a heart issue. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Do you remember God brought up the people out of slavery, out of Egypt, where they cried out to God because their conditions were so poor? They were brutalized, taken advantage of. They cried out to God, and God raised up a leader. And he delivered them from wicked, the tyrant, Pharaoh. And then what did they end up doing? God called them to the promised land, but then they rebelled, and they ended up wandering around 40 years until all the generation that had left Egypt, all the men from a certain age group and up, till they all passed away and they didn't get to see the promised land. They missed out on the promise because of their rebellion. So where's this quoted from? Well, it's quoted directly from Psalm 95, actually. But at first, let's see what this psalm is about. Look at the very beginning of Psalm 95, 1. Remember Hebrews 3? It talks about attendance in the household of God and being together. And then rebellion, well, look here. Psalm 95 begins with a call. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. By the way, it says let us come to him into his presence with thanksgiving, not with grumbling and I didn't get enough sleep and yelling at the kids because they're not getting ready in time, right? That's not the heart when you come to worship. It's with thanksgiving. But look at what goes on in this psalm. 95 and verse 8, it says, Do not harden your hearts, just like we just read in Hebrews 3, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. All right, so now we have an, a specific event that we can tie on to Hebrews 3 that the Hebrews writer was mentioning, which leads us to the question, what happened to Meribah and Massa? What went on there? Well, if you remember, I'll just have a few of the verses put here. In verse 3, it says, But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So my, Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Remember, what had God just done for them? Brought them out from the hands of a tyrant who was brutalizing them and beating them. Right? Remember, the Egyptian was even beating the Hebrew. Remember, this was a common occurrence, and they wanted God's help. And then all of a sudden, conditions aren't what they hoped, you know? Kind of wasn't up to snuff what, what they wanted to go on there, and so they complain. So in the story leading up to this one, you remember what happened in the previous chapter? They get hungry, and what does God do? He provides them with manna. Bread falls from heaven, <laughs> like literally falls from heaven. God's saying, I have you taken care of. If he can make bread rain down from the sky, as far as I'm aware, that's not a normal occurrence. I've never had brain fall from the brain. Bread fall from the sky. Oh, that'd be really bad if rain fell from the sky. Bread fall from the sky. So they knew that God was able to take care of them. He had already proved his providential protection, even bringing them up out of Egypt. But as soon as they became thirsty, as soon as they got scared, worried, circumstances they didn't like, they were ready to go back to Egypt. I think that's enough. I tried it, God, your way for a little bit. Not very fun. And they want to go back. I mean, that's an absolute slap in the face to God's divine planning, to Moses, to all the thought and providential work and miracles that he put in to their salvation. And yet they weren't content with it. In verse 5, it says, and the, and the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Now, why do you think that would be? Why the staff that struck the Nile? Remember, it, it call to memory all the things that that staff had done throughout the process. And you're like, look, this is the tool of God. This is an instrument of God. And you know, you've seen this staff in action. You've seen what it has done. Verse 6, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So again, God takes care of his people, no matter how much like tempestuous babies they act like. God still takes care of them. 
No offense, by the way. <laughs> Verse 7. It says, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying. Now, what was, what was really going on here? What was the problem with what the Israelites did? Well, they name it after the problem. Is the Lord among us or not? That's what they said, at least in their hearts there at the time. So this is kind of a contradictory statement, by the way, in the Hebrew. I'll look at that. It's kind of interesting. So when they ask is, that literally means being or existence. But whose existence? Yahweh, the existing one. So they say, is the existing one's existence among us or not? You see, that's a contradictory statement. Of course he's among them. He is the existing one. And yet they felt like God wasn't there. Yahweh's not here. It can't be. I'm thirsty. <laughs> I, I feel like I have something I need and I want, and it's not getting met. So how can God be here? After all, after all God would want me to have exactly what I want and when I want it, right? I would had enough to eat in Egypt. They didn't understand. They did not understand God's salvation. So what was the sin? They doubted God's presence was truly among them. Well, keep that in mind as we continue to read. In verse 12, going back to Hebrews, it says, Take care, brothers. That's all of us. Take care. Be careful. Be on guard. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. How many times have we read that verse? And we just goes right over our heads in the sense of, do we really consider maybe I have an evil and unbelieving heart? I, I feel like we don't really think that enough. We kind of always assume that we'd be the heroes or the protagonists in these Bible stories, but most likely we would be just another one of those Israelites complaining in the wilderness and really questioning, well, what's the point of this? I don't understand the logistics. I've analyzed the situation. I've analyzed our path, and it doesn't, this doesn't seem like a direct route. This doesn't seem like the way we should be going. I think we should go back. That makes more sense. I think we all have that evil, unbelieving heart. And it's not necessarily, uh, I mean, there's a lot worse things to have because there's still hope. And that's why he says to encourage. Why do we need encouragement? Because we do, because we are vulnerable. We can have that evil and unbelieving heart because sin is deceitful. That's what, exactly what he says. So what's the antidote to that? It's each other. It's exactly what Doug talked about this morning. So you keep me accountable. I help keep you accountable. So that way we don't fall into the hands of the enemy. So that way we don't lose our salvation. So that way we don't wander our whole lives and end up dying without any resolution or seeing the promises that we've worked to achieve. That's the purpose of attendance. It's not just to get you sit in the pew. I mean, we don't need bench warmers. <laughs> That's not what we need. We need sincere people dedicated to the work and to accountability and to exhortation from one another. In Hebrews 10, 23, it says as much. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Remember he said in Hebrews 3, remember he talked about we are the house of God if we do not, it, it, well, if we hold fast to our hope that we have in Christ Jesus, it says, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And he calls it a confession. What's the purpose of confession? Again, you say it out loud in front of other witnesses. And what would the purpose of that be? To be a witness, to help keep you and be kind of like a, a coach on the sidelines of help rooting for you. You know, you know, boxers have that guy in their corner who's always rooting for them, giving them directions. It's kind of like that. We're each other's cornermen. We've got to have each other's backs. Verse 25 not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. And that's not, the that's not the command. That's not the purpose. The purpose of meeting together isn't just to meet together. The purpose of meeting together is to encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's the purpose. And simply, you cannot do that if you're not here with the people. You can't. Unless you think you're smarter than God or you have some spiritual miraculous ability, I I'm unaware of. You can't accomplish these goals. How do I know that? Because God designed the church to be assembled together. And I know what God builds is perfect and it is intentional. Now, what about the elephant in the room? 
Um, I have papers that I handed to Wyatt and Caden. If you guys don't mind going ahead and handing out those little questionnaires. I have a little sheet. And it's, it's a little overdue. I'm going to talk about uh, the pandemic. But before I do that, I just want to make a couple disclaimers. First of all, I'm not speaking to sincere people who have health struggles and were terrified at, at, of the disease and were at greater risk or maybe they had surgeries or anything like that. I'm not making any personal judgments into your life, and I, I believe that that's between you and your God, and I'm not going to step in any way, shape, or form there. But I'm talking, and I want to be very clear about this. I'm speaking to the people who you know in your heart the pandemic was a license for convenience. And I'm not even judging you on that, because like Doug said, I remember I went on vacation once during the pandemic, and I didn't have to get up and go anywhere. I sat in my hotel room, and guess what? It was great. I was like, I didn't have to get ready. I didn't have to get up too early. This was pretty, this was really convenient. And you know what? That was, that was pretty nice, just doing my sermons from home on my laptop. You know, that, that was pretty easy. But it's not about being easy. And I know a lot of people, a lot of Christians who would, didn't go to church for the longest time, didn't assemble, would just watch church online. They didn't get together with any of the saints at any of their potlucks, any of their events, anything like that. They wouldn't make time for the brethren. And yet I would see those same people post pictures of, their and the, of them and their friends from work on Facebook at a party. I'm speaking to that. I'm speaking to those who everything else was normal except worship. That's what I'm speaking to. I'd like to ask, why did our government deem adult clubs, bars, and abortion clinics as essential and the worship of God as not essential? Why was that okay with us if it was? Why was that an acceptable standard to have? That's a, that's a shame. Why have some never returned fully since the pandemic? What's going on here? And again, my concern isn't just people sitting in a pew. That's not what it is. Please understand that when we're not gathered together as the full body, that hurts the whole. It hurts me when I see gaps in the pews of people who have faith, faithfully attended for the longest time. It hurts me. I know it hurts the people around me. I've, I've, some of you have confided in me in the discouragement that you have faced because of that. I'm not out to beat anybody or to get on to anybody. My goal is to get you to understand you're wanted here. You're needed here. We're not the same without all of us together. Could it be that the root problem of all of this is like the Israelites, when we gather together, do we question, is God really among us? Is the Lord really here in the collective assembly? And I'll tell you this, if you don't believe that's the case, if you don't believe that God manifests himself when the church is assembled together like we are today, then it's not going to be an essential part of your Christian walk because you won't believe it. But if you think I'm out of line or anything like that, I truly understand. I, I really understand. I'm a young guy. It's easy to write off, but I want you to understand my heart. And I put this verse on here because I related to it. The aim of our charge is love. That issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So please understand, I'm not trying to thump anybody with Bibles. I love you guys and I feel charged, I feel compelled, and I really need to repent because I've avoided this topic because I was scared of hurting people's feelings and I don't want that to be the case. But I felt, and <laughs> someone else gave me some advice that I should maybe talk about this, and I, I felt like it was time, so please understand that. So if you look at the questionnaire I handed out, I'd like you to answer this for, and then turn them all into me. I'm just kidding. Don't. <laughs> this is just for you. This is just for you. Just take a look at this. The first question is, did the pandemic make you spiritually stronger or weaker? I'll just give you a second to think about that. Did the pandemic make you spiritually stronger or weaker? My second question. If you answered stronger, you feel that you've been stronger since the pandemic, I would like to ask you why. Why is that the case? I put here 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 26. It says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. 
If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individual and individually members of it. Do you remember this text? When Paul is calling the body of Christ and the members, he says, you know, some are hands, some are knees. There's all different parts of the body. It's the same body, but individually we make up different aspects. We serve different functions. We have different roles. And we all work in harmony with one another to accomplish these goals. And I'm going to tell you, if you're just by yourself or just with your family in your home and you're watching online, please understand you're just like a decapitated hand by yourself. You're, you're not attached to the body. You're alone in your house. It's like this Frankenstein of all these different body parts scattered across in different homes, and that's not what God wanted. He wanted the body together, assembled in one place. And he even says, in verse 19, he says, if all were a single member, where would the body be? If we were all just an ear, if we were all just a toe, and all, if we were all just a nose, well, where would we be? Well, we'd be dead, <laughs> because we're not attached to one another. And when we're isolated that, like that and just in our homes and just watching online, we're not really assembled together as part of the body. We're just body parts scattered across, and we can't serve the same function. And then I know some people would say, but I have gained so much knowledge over the pandemic. I've really had time to study, and I had a lot of downtime to listen to a lot of sermons and everything, so it's been great. Good. I'm so glad. And I don't, I don't mean that insincerely. I'm very glad if that is the case. And I got to learn a lot more during the pandemic as well. But is knowledge strength? Is knowledge what makes you spiritually strong? Well, Paul answers that in 1 Corinthians 8. This is now concerning food offered to idols. We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Knowledge isn't going to cut cut it because knowledge just puffs up. Because when I feel just, you know, smart, like, oh, I discovered something, I usually just give myself a pat on the back and then I start feeling smarter. But it does no good if there's no love to benefit one another. And if one of you rejoice, we all rejoice. If one of you mourns, we all mourn. And how can we do that if we don't know what's going on in each other's lives? We're not assembled together. I mean, a screen doesn't cut it, you know, and you know that. I mean, would you, would, for those of you who are married, you know, would it work if you just FaceTimed your spouse all the time and never saw each other in person? Could you have a really health and, healthy and budding and successful relationship if that's the only way you communicated was over a screen? No. I mean, we know that. We all know that. We wouldn't implement that in our real lives with real relationships. So why is the church any different? Is it just because we don't think spiritual things are that important? That's the only reasonable excuse I can get, is if you don't believe that spiritual things are as important as physical. Then I understand. <laughs> I see the problem. <laughs> but if you claim to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, a disciple who's part of the church, you need to act like it. <clears throat> and maybe you are just that intelligent, and maybe you are just that spiritually strong that you are not affected by not assembling with the brothers and sisters. But I wasn't. I'm not. I'm not that strong. I know a lot of Christians here who have been Christians for years and years and years who they aren't that strong, and it took a toll on them. I mean, that pandemic took a huge spiritual chunk out of me because I was in mourning, and I don't say that lightly. I was in mourning, and a lot of people close to me, we were lamenting at the fact that all across the globe, my brother told me on the phone, he said, I just feel like Satan got a victory. Because you think for a period in time, all the churches across the world, the globe, were shut down. I mean, Satan had to be pretty happy about that. It's just something for us to consider. Question three, is being a Christian merely about individual development? Romans 15.1, it says, we who are strong have a what? We have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Maybe you did just fine during the pandemic. Maybe you did learn a lot. But what about those who didn't? What about the people who were struggling silently? What about the people who were neglected, who got forgotten, who since the pandemic hit have turned their back on the Lord altogether? And we haven't seen since. That's been the case. That's something we need to mourn about collectively, all of us. That's something all of us bear a responsibility for. 
and something that all of us will have to give an account for. So I want us to be prepared for this. I want us to make sure we have the right hearts. And finally, do we view the church analytically or spiritually? I think that's really the biggest thing. Do you view the function of the church as just uh, analytical? I learned a lot saying, check, check, check. I mean, because I can see if, if you have the analytical worldview of the church, that would understand. I would watch sermons online too because there's a lot better sermons by a lot better preachers than me. And so like if you get online and you can see that, Great, you have, uh, I get better sermons. You know what? You can click on another congregation singing that has, you know, maybe 500 people that they have a lot better singing. Okay, so then I got better singing, can get a better sermon. I can get all from the comfort of my home and sit down on my laptop and enjoy. But is the church just about the mere act of singing or the mere act of listening to the sermon, or does it run deeper? Is there something bigger to the assembly? Revelation 2 and verse 1 is a very humbling Reminder, you remember this? In John's vision, there's a letter to the seven churches. And just one of them, it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And if you are familiar with your Old Testament, you know that the lampstands were an instrument of worship in the tabernacle for God. And so these churches are represented as these burning lampstands that are in the very throne of God that Jesus himself walks among. And he speaks to this church. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You see that there's a collective identity to the church. There's an angel that represents all the members unified together. And so it's unlikely that all these people were committing these sins, right? But some people were, and it was affecting the whole. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6, Paul tells us that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he was talking about that sin, that sexual morality that was going on at the church, and it was affecting the communion of the whole congregation. Your individual struggles... And your individual strengths affect the whole body and its worship in the kingdom before Jesus, before God himself. You think about that? I mean, that's kind of a scary thought. It's also an exciting thought. But we bear a responsibility for how that lampstand is represented to God because we are that. We are the worship, all of us together, not just you at your home, not just me preaching. It's all of us unified together because God has a role for you and he's made the body in such a way as this, intentionally. Don't be thinking that we're smarter than God, okay? Because we're not. If we act like it, it's just going to lead to division, corruption, and people falling away from God. And I've seen it over and over since this pandemic, and I'm tired of it. I don't want to lose any more brothers and sisters because of an evil, unbelieving heart that I feel I have contributed to for not addressing these things sooner. We all bear a responsibility, not just me, not just Gis, not just Dutch, not just Donna, not just Rick, not just Greg, not just Ann. All of us, we have to give an answer for that lampstand. We all bear the responsibility to let our light shine. Well, the panic attack is over. I was very stressed about this lesson. Uh, It's not one I'm necessarily comfortable with, and I'm probably going to do like a lesson on grace or something next week to make make up for all this. But I sincerely want you all to understand that everything I said, it's not because I'm just, you know, looking forward to critiquing, and I hate it. I hate it. It's It's the part I like least about preaching. But it's a necessary part, and so please understand that even if I'm wrong, maybe I was wrong about some things, but I hope you understand my heart, and that's love, and it's exhortation, because we have to exhort one another as long as it is still called today. And last I checked, it's today, all right? So I want to exhort you guys. And this didn't really apply. If if, If you're not a member of the church, well, you're missing out on the presence of God. You know, the presence of God affords you blessings. It affords you eternal life, forgiveness, a peace that passes understanding. And you try going your own way for a while, and maybe you're having fun now, but it's going to get pretty old and pretty lonely pretty quick. You're going to run out of meaning pretty fast. 
And then that's when you're going to want to turn. But save yourself the heartache. Save yourself the trouble because you're not going to find anything that's near as satisfying as the love of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you would like to make that commitment to become a child of his, we'd love to talk about how to do that. And if you want to do that, please come forward as we stand and sing.